Well, good morning, Sinod. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, the Reverend Julian Pursehouse, who's the chair of the East Anglia district and also a member of the candidating review group. And I'm going to talk to Julian a little bit about uh, uh, the candidating review and uh, what the new process will look like. So good morning, Julian. Good morning, Richard, and good morning to Sinod. It's good to be with you today. Julian, why was it felt necessary to reform the candidating process? Um, I think probably the <clears throat> best place to start really with that is to recognise that this was a piece of work that was commissioned by the Ministries Committee. And there was a recognition that the time had come for a comprehensive review of a process which, broadly speaking, had been in place since 1932. So purely on that basis, I think it was, uh, you know, the time was ripe to look at the process. Um, I think some particular reasons, um, which I think are worth um, highlighting. Um, I think there was a clear desire to uh, design a process that was more appropriate for the size and nature of the British Methodist Church today, recognising that we are a smaller church and also recognising that it would be good to have a process that was uh, perhaps sufficiently nimble and flexible to be able to adapt to the changing needs of the church and the changing understandings of calling and vocation. Uh, I think a couple of other reasons. Uh, second one, I think that there should be a good and proper use of our financial resources and also our people resources and that there was a need to redesign the process. And finally, and I think quite importantly, to, to uh, design a process uh, that could uh, perhaps remove some of the unintentional obstacles and barriers that I think sometimes have been perceived in the process as people have experienced it. So I would say those were the main reasons, Richard. Can we kind of uh, explore the, the process in, in a minute? I mean, you, you're talking about uh, barriers and uh, removing some of the unnecessary barriers that are preventing people from candidating. There also seems to be much more flexibility in what's been proposed for those who are sensing a call to a, a local contextual, maybe even a pioneer ministry. I mean, why do you think that's important? And it may be that there are some things in East Anglia very similar to, to what's happening here that you might want to reflect on as well. Yeah, I think there's a, certainly a desire, Richard, when the working group got to work, that we should have a process that was uh, far more flexible and could recognise that calling and vocation is, is a broad spectrum of things. And uh, we needed a process that wasn't simply perceived as being the route by which you get to test the call to presbyteral or diaconal ministry recognising that there is a whole raft of ministries nowadays as we think about local pioneers, as we think about development of local lay pastors and, you know, that whole thing about emphasising the ministry of the whole people of God and recognising that, you know, vocation and calling, there is a rich spectrum to that and that needed to be reflected in the process in order to be able to affirm that and recognise that amongst God's people. That's great, thank you. I'm just going to show uh, Synod a, a slide, which is a, a slide that's included in the conference report. It just gives a kind of quick uh, kind of graphic, uh, giving an overview of the, of the process as it's, uh, as it's now going to work. So you'll see that there are uh, three stages, Synod. Uh, phase one, explore, uh, discover and candidate. So it's a much more kind of differentiated process. Julian, I wonder if you could uh, take us through each of those uh, elements, explore, discover, candidate. Yeah, so I think the expectation would be that at, at the beginning, um, we begin with phase one, which is the exploratory stage, where the key thing is that people who sense some kind of calling or vocation will register to become an explorer. And really the key component of that is they will become part of a covenanted small group of people who will be together for an experience over a 10 month period when they will be meeting together regularly to learn, to reflect, to share in discernment conversations 
And alongside that covenanted programme, there will be opportunities for shadowing experience to be alongside presbyters, deacons, or indeed circuit stewards or local preachers. There will be an encouragement to uh, engage in spiritual journaling. And the other key component in that exploratory stage is that each person will be linked with an accompanist. The accompanist will be a trained person who will be well skilled in discernment and vocational conversation and reflection. And uh, each explorer will be meeting with the accompanist on a regular basis to reflect upon what they are learning about their call. So, it's, so the emphasis is very much upon an exploratory stage here without any presumption that that might be leading to presbyteral ministry or diaconal ministry. At this sense, there is, you know, at this stage, there is that kind of broad kind of affirmation of, of call in the widest possible sense. But are there, are there any entry requirements to that, Julian? I mean, you know, certainly for candidating as it's been, you've either had to be a local preacher for you know, presbyteral ministry or a, a worship leader for diaconal ministry. What's the what's it going to look like now? I think the key thing, Richard, there will be that it will it will simply be the need to be able to articulate some sense that what one is wanting to explore a vocation, that one has a sense of God stirring in one's life and one is being called to something. Um, and there will be a letter of support that would be required from a superintendent or local minister or indeed other people that might be relevant to that particular person's circumstances. So the entry requirements, the exploratory stage are in a sense are quite low, <laughs> deliberately so to uh, to make it very accessible. Great, thank you. Yeah. So discover what happens then. So discover, uh, we move on <laughs> to the second stage uh, with the recognition that some people may have got to the end of the exploratory stage and felt a calling to a particular kind of ministry that is not ordained to ministry. And they may already have been pointed in the direction, for example, of training to be a local preacher or a local lay pastor. For those who do sense a call to ordain ministry, they then move into the discovery stage and I think <clears throat> the key uh, component to that will be the opportunity to have a fairly in-depth conversation with people from the Connectional uh, Selection Committee and the accompanist to reflect upon the learning that has been done in the exploratory stage and to begin to think through with a critical group of people the implications of ordained ministry. Uh, so that's the pragmatic side of it as well as the theological side of it and exploring the covenant relationship with the church. Um, they, if, if then the feeling is that there is yeah, a sense of call to ordain ministry, they will then uh, go to the ordained vocational advisory group. And I think the emphasis there is that this is advisory. It will be a group of people who will meet for an in-depth conversation um to really reflect upon whether you know that is the right course to take um the other part of the um discovery section is a, the opportunity of a three-day retreat richard when there will be a group of people together uh, who will have a fairly intensive three-day reflection on ministerial calling um, so that's, that's the content of, of, of stage two, with the recognition, Richard, that that is, at this stage, it's exploratory and advisory. There are no decisions being made. It's about creating the kind of ethos whereby people can do the good reflection on their calling. So it sounds like there's a lot more kind of face-to-face -face contact than has been the case in the past, certainly at the early yeah. stages. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because one of the things the... Um, the working group discovered, Richard, when we had fairly extensive conversations with other denominations reflecting on their uh, process of, of selection, was that in a comparative sense, the British Methodist Church and its processes allowed really less time face to face. So we, one of the key aims was to maximise a process by which that was, in, that was increased and it has been significantly. So somebody decides to candidate, perhaps having been through that advisory process, they're now required to, to be a member for a year. That's yeah. the only um, hurdle they need to, 
to, to get a, a baptised and a member for the year. Uh, so they move into the candidating process. What does that look like now? Well, the candidating process, when it finally comes to uh, phase three, the candidating process will, will seem, I think for most people who are used to the process we've already had, will seem in some ways a lot shorter and more succinct. There are two key elements to it, really. There will be a required portfolio. Uh, with a whole range of possibilities for the material that might be um, within that and the creative opportunities in which that could be presented. Part of the portfolio will be a letter from the ordained advisory group, from the circuit leadership team, from the accompanist and the critical friend. Um, the other the other component will be the 48 hour residential, uh, in a sense, connection on selection committee. Um, which will be uh, an intensive 48 hours for group exercises, for one-to-one -one conversations, for triangular conversations, and for group work in the preparation of worship. And it will be at that point, the one single point, when the uh, selection will be done in relation to the criteria, criteria that we recognise for ordained ministry. So our, our, uh, how it looks at the moment is I think we anticipate that that process would be concluded by the end of January, beginning of February. Now, the, it, one of the things to recognise about that as an opportunity is that there will be, uh, if you like, a fallow period between then and potentially then going off to the uh, theological institution at Queen's. And I think what we would hope for is that there can be some good consultation about uh, preparatory learning that could still play, take place during that period of time so that, so that there's, there's a kind of a better transition into the Queen's programme uh, that, that, than, that, than is presently experienced, I think. Yeah, great, thank you. Just one final question. Um, we, we've been really blessed in the, in the district of with having you know, two uh, probationers who were ordained at the last conference and uh, a new probationer who's with us for the first time at, at this synod. And it's just uh, evidence people may be surprised by this, but God continues to call people. And there may be people in our synod, your synod I'm sure too, uh, who are feeling a sense of call at the moment, or maybe they know somebody that's feeling mm -hmm. a, a sense of call. I mean, what words of encouragement would you give to them? Well, I think the first thing I would want to say, um, Richard, you know, hearing stories like yours and that they would be echoed from other parts of the connection is uh, we do need to rejoice <laughs> because I think when people sense a calling, then, you know, I think that, that that sense that, you know, God is at work, God is present, God is being perceived and God is calling people. So we will rejoice in that. I think in terms of the, the specific encouragement or advice I might give to somebody is to say that actually, I would encourage people to be having a conversation with somebody who is a trusted, uh, mature, wise Christian disciple who perhaps can hold that kind of conversation well, in which one can hear oneself articulating one's story. Um, uh, and I think for me that the importance of that is that on the one hand, calling is a deeply personal thing but it's never just that alone it's a calling within the wider body of Christ and therefore that sense of being able to interact with another disciple who can you know listen to our story be a sounding board and reflect things back to us I, I think is profoundly important and um, I mean it if I reflect upon my own journey, Richard, I remember what that felt like having that first conversation, feeling as though one was breaking the sound barrier by daring to suggest that you might think that God is calling you to ordain ministry. But actually, that's a profoundly important thing and a liberating thing to do. Thank you. That's, I mean, thank you, Julian, for, for the generosity of your time, but also for sharing so, so wonderfully, actually, the, the new process with us. So thank you and every blessing upon you and upon the East Anglia Synod. Do send our greetings. Will do. Thank you very much. Thank you.